I was a fool to think our love could withstand anything. Looking back now, I realize how naive that belief was. But when you're young and in love, you feel invincible. The day I met Linda, I knew my life would never be the same. It was a scorching summer afternoon at the county fair, and I was there with my buddy Jake, mostly to ogle the girls and stuff our faces with funnel cake. That's when I saw her, this petite blonde firecracker in cute off shorts and a tank top, laughing as she tried to knock down milk bottles with a softball. Dan, Jake whistled. Check out the hottie of the milk bottle toss. I barely heard him. I was already moving towards her, drawn like a moth to a flame. She missed her throw, cursing colorfully enough to make the carny blush. I couldn't help but laugh. She whirled around, ready to tear into whoever was making fun of her. But when our eyes met, something electric passed between us. Her anger melted into a smile that damn near stopped my heart. Think you can do better, tough guy, she challenged, holding out another softball. I grinned, taking the ball. Darling, I could knock those bottles down with my eyes closed. Prove it, she smirked. I did, three times in a row. By the time I handed her the giant stuffed bear I'd won, we were both laughing like we'd known each other for years. I'm Sam, I said, suddenly shy. Linda, she replied, hugging that ridiculous bear. Nice to meet you, Sam. We spent the rest of the day together, riding the Ferris wheel, sharing cotton candy, and talking about everything and nothing. By the time the sun set, I knew I was in love. And when I kissed her goodnight under the fireworks, tasting sugar and summer on her lips, I silently vowed I'd marry this girl someday. Fast forward two years, and there we were, standing in front of a justice of the peace, exchanging vows and cheap rings we'd scraped together to buy. Linda was 19, working as a nurse at County General. I was 20, just starting out as a long-haul trucker. We were young, broke, and crazy about each other. You may now kiss the bride, the judge said, and I didn't need to be told twice. I dipped in the back, kissing her like my life depended on it, while our small group of family and friends cheered. I love you, Sammy, Linda whispered when we came up for air, her eyes shining with tears and joy. I love you too, Lindy Lou, I replied, using the nickname that always made her scrunch up her nose in mock annoyance, forever and always. God, we were so naive back then, so sure that our love could conquer anything life threw at us. If only we'd known what was coming. The first few years of our marriage were tough but wonderful. Money was always tight. Linda's nursing salary barely covered rent and utilities, while my trucking gigs were sporadic at first. But we were happy. We'd stay up late talking about our dreams, the house we'd buy someday, the family we'd have, the adventures we'd go on. Two years in, those dreams started coming true. I'll never forget the day Linda told me she was pregnant. I'd just gotten back from a week-long haul, bone-tired and smelling like diesel. She was waiting for me on the porch of our tiny apartment, practically vibrating with excitement. Sammy, she said, her voice trembling. We did it. I froze, my duffel bag slipping from my shoulder. You mean? She nodded, tears spilling down her cheeks as she held up a positive pregnancy test. I let out a whoop that probably woke the whole neighborhood, sweeping her into my arms and spinning her around. We're gonna be parents. I laughed, kissing her between words. Holy shit, Lindy, we're having a baby. Nine months later, Michael James Townsend came screaming into the world. He was perfect. Ten fingers, ten toes, and a shock of blonde hair, just like his mama's. I cried like a baby when the nurse placed him in my arms, this tiny miracle we created. Hey there, little man, I whispered, voice choked with emotion. I'm your daddy, and I promise I'm always going to be here for you, no matter what. Linda reached out, stroking Michael's cheek with a trembling finger. He's beautiful, Sammy, our little boy. I leaned down, kissing her sweaty forehead. You did good, Lindy Lou. Real good. Life felt even crazier after Michael was born. I took on more routes to make extra money, while Linda juggled nursing shifts and midnight feedings. We were exhausted most of the time, but so incredibly happy.
every milestone. Michael's first smile, first word, first steps felt like a miracle. Three years later, we were blessed again. Emily Rose Townsend arrived on a stormy April night, all pink and perfect with a set of lungs to rival her brothers. Michael, now a rambunctious toddler, was fascinated by his baby sister. Can I hold her, Daddy? He asked, blue eyes wide with wonder. Sure thing, buddy, I said, carefully arranging him on the hospital chair. Just remember to support her head, okay? Michael nodded sullenly, arms outstretched. When I placed Emily in his lap, his whole face lit up. Hi, Emmy, he cooed. I'm your big brother. I'm gonna take care of you forever and ever. Linda and I exchanged tearful smiles over our children's heads. In that moment, everything felt right with the world. We had our little family, our own piece of the American dream. Nothing could touch us. But life has a way of shattering even the most perfect illusions. The years flew by in a blur of school plays, little league games, and family vacations squeezed in between my long hauls and Linda's nursing shifts. Before we knew it, Michael was 18, a high school senior with his whole life ahead of him. I got in, he shouted one day, bursting through the front door waving an envelope. Mitt, full ride. We celebrated that night, the four of us crowded around our beat-up kitchen table. I barbecued steaks, a rare treat, while Linda made Michael's favorite potato salad. Even 15-year-old Emily, usually too cool for family dinners, was caught up in the excitement. I've always knew you were a genius, she teased, punching Michael's arm affectionately. Yeah, yeah, he grinned, ruffling her hair. Just wait till it's your turn, Squirt. You'll be begging me for application tips. Linda raised her glass of iced tea. To Michael, she said, voice thick with pride. Our future engineer. The world better watch out. We clinked glasses, laughing and talking about Michael's plans. I remember thinking how lucky we were, how perfect everything was. If I'd known it was the last time we'd all be happy together, maybe I would have savored it more. Two weeks later, our world imploded. It was a Friday night in February, bitter cold with a nasty winter storm moving in. Michael had come home for the weekend to help Emily with a science project. I was due to leave for a long haul in the morning, so we'd all stayed up late, playing board games and enjoying each other's company. Around midnight, Michael's phone buzzed. His friend Jake was having car trouble and needed a ride home from a party. Michael, always the responsible one, volunteered to pick him up. Be careful, baby, Linda said, kissing his cheek. The roads are getting messy. I will, Mon, he promised. I'll be back before you know it. Those were the last words he ever said to us. Three hours later, a knock at the door jolted us awake. Linda and I stumbled downstairs, hearts pounding. Deep down, I think we both knew. But nothing could have prepared us for the sight of two police officers standing on our porch, faces grim in the porch light. Mr. and Mrs. Townsend, one of them asked, I'm Officer Johnson. This is my partner, Officer Chen. May we come in? The world tilted sideways as they explained. Black ice on the highway. Michael's car had hit it going around a curve. He lost control, flipped several times. By the time emergency services arrived, I don't remember much after that. Just fragments. Linda's scream. A sound of pure anguish that still haunts my dreams. The thud as she collapsed, me barely catching her before she hit the floor. Emily appearing at the top of the stairs, face pale with fear. Daddy, she called, voice small and scared. What's happening? I opened my mouth, but no words came out. How do you tell your 15-year-old that her big brother is gone forever? In the end, I just held out my arm. She flew down the stairs and into my embrace. The three of us clung to each other on the floor, sobbing while those poor cops stood there awkwardly, muttering condolences. The days that followed were a blur of grief and disbelief, identifying Michael's body at the morgue. Planning a funeral, I never thought I'd have to plan. Watching Linda move through the house like a ghost, touching Michael's things with trembling hands. The funeral was, God, I don't even know how to describe it. So many people, 
Michael's friends, teachers, our extended family. All of them offering hollow words of comfort that did nothing to fill the gaping hole in our hearts. Linda and I stood there like statues, barely acknowledging the endless stream of mourners. Emily refused to leave our sides, gripping our hands so tightly it almost hurt. When they lowered that casket into the ground, it felt like they were burying a piece of us too. After that, nothing was the same. The house felt too big, too quiet, without Michael's laughter filling it. His room became a shrine. Linda refused to change a thing. I'd come home from long halls to find her curled up on his bed, clutching his old sweatshirt and sobbing. I tried to be there for her, I really did. But the grief was crushing me too. So I did what I'd always done when things got tough. I ran, took on more routes, longer halls, Anything to stay away from that silent house and my wife's dead eyes. It was about six months after we lost Michael that I first noticed the empty wine bottles in the recycling. At first, I wrote it off as normal. Hell, I was throwing back a few whiskies myself most nights. But then the empty started piling up. Wine gave way to vodka, then to bourbon. I confronted her one night after coming home to find her passed out on the couch, an empty bottle of Jack by her feet. Linda, baby, you got slow down. I said gently, shaking her awake. This isn't healthy. She blinked up at me, eyes unfocused. Don't start, Sam. I'm coping the best I can. By drinking yourself into oblivion every night, that's not coping, that's hiding. Linda struggled to sit up, anger flashing in her bloodshot eyes. Oh, and running away for weeks at a time is better. At least I'm here, Sam. Where the hell are you? Her words stung because I knew she was right. I was running, plain and simple. But I couldn't stop. Being in that house, seeing Linda waste away, it was killing me. So I kept taking jobs, kept putting miles between us. All the while telling myself it was temporary, that things would get better. They didn't. A year passed then too. Linda's drinking got worse. She started missing work calling in sick more often than not. I begged her to get help, even found a rehab facility nearby. But she refused, insisting she had it under control. I'm fine, Sam, she'd say, words slightly slurred. I'm not some junkie. I can stop any time I want. But she never did, and I never pushed hard enough. It was easier to leave, to bury myself in work, and pretend everything was fine. Emily was the one who really suffered. She went from being a bubbly, outgoing kid to this quiet, withdrawn teenager. I tried to talk to her, but she'd just shrug and retreat to her room. I knew she was hurting, knew she needed us. But I didn't know how to help her when I couldn't even help myself. Things came to a head at Emily's high school graduation. I'd taken time off work to be there, sitting in the auditorium waiting for Linda to arrive. But as name after name was called, there was still no sign of her. When they got to Emily Townsend, I watched my baby girl walk across that stage alone. No mother to cheer her on, no proud smile as she accepted her diploma. Just me, capping like a madman and fighting back tears. Afterward, I found Emily surrounded by her friends and their families. The look on her face when she saw me approach alone. God, it damn near broke me. Where's mom? she asked, voice flat. I opened my mouth to make some excuse, but Emily just shook her head. Never mind, I know. That night, I came home to find Linda passed out cold, surrounded by empty bottles. Something in me snapped. I grabbed a trash bag and started throwing out every drop of booze in the house. Linda woke up partway through my rampage, screaming at me to stop. You missed your daughter's graduation, I roared. Do you even care anymore? Linda stumbled to her feet, face twisted with rage and shame. Of course I care. How dare you? How dare I? How dare you? Our son is dead, Linda. Dead. But that doesn't mean you get to check out on the rest of us. Emily needs you. I need you. But you're too busy drowning yourself to notice. We went back and forth like that for hours, years of pent-up anger and grief pouring out. In the end, Linda stormed out of the house. She didn't come back for three days. 
Looking back, I think that was the beginning of the end for us. We'd been drifting apart for years, but that night shattered what little connection remained. After that, we were just two strangers sharing a house, going through the motions of a marriage neither of us believed in anymore. It was around this time that Tom started showing up more often. He was our next door neighbor, a widower about 10 years older than us. Nice enough guy, always offering to help with yard work or house repairs. At first, I was grateful. God knows I wasn't around enough to take care of that stuff myself. But then I started noticing little things. The way Linda would perk up when Tom came over. How she put on makeup and fix her hair before he arrived. The lingering hugs that seemed a bit too friendly. I tried to ignore it. Told myself I was being paranoid that Linda wouldn't do that to me. Not after 25 years of marriage. Not with everything we'd been through. But the doubts kept gnawing at me. One day, I came home early from a short haul to find them in our backyard. Linda was laughing, actually laughing, at something Tom had said. He had his arm around her waist and the look on his face. Well, let's just say it wasn't neighborly. I cleared my throat loudly, making them jump apart like guilty teenagers. Having fun? I asked, not bothering to hide the edge in my voice. Linda's face flushed red. Sam. I didn't expect you back so soon. Tom was just helping me with the garden. I'm sure he was, I muttered. Tom made some excuse about needing to get home and practically ran out of there. Once he was gone, I turned to Linda. Want to tell me what that was about? She wouldn't meet my eyes. It was nothing, Sam. You're overreacting. Overreacting? My wife is cuddled up with another man in our backyard. I'm overreacting. Linda's eyes flashed with anger. Oh, so now on your wife? Funny, I thought I was just the drunk you can't wait to get away from. We argued for hours that night. Ugly, hurtful words that we could never take back. In the end, Linda stormed off to the guest room, and I was left alone with my suspicions and a bottle of whiskey. After that, I started paying closer attention. Checking Linda's phone when she wasn't looking, coming home at odd hours, hoping to catch them together. It was eating me up inside, but I had to know the truth. Then came that fateful night. I was supposed to leave for a three-day haul, but at the last minute, I decided to stay home. Didn't tell Linda. I wanted to surprise her, maybe try to reconnect. I pulled up to the house around 9 p.m. and saw Tom's pickup in our driveway. My stomach dropped, but I told myself not to jump to conclusions. Maybe he was just helping with something in the house. Maybe Linda had called him because something was broken. But as I approached the front door, I heard laughter coming from inside. Linda's laughter, light and carefree in a way I hadn't heard in years. My hand froze on the doorknob, heart pounding so loud I was sure they'd hear it inside. For a moment, I considered turning around, getting back in my truck and pretending I'd never come home. But I couldn't. I had to know. I quietly let myself in, following the sound upstairs to our bedroom. With each step, memories flashed through my mind. Carrying Linda over this threshold, on our wedding night, Michael taking his first steps here, Emily calling for us after a nightmare. How had we gone from those happy times to this? The door was cracked open. I could see Linda and Tom on our bed, tangled up in the sheets. They were kissing, hands roaming, over each other's bodies. I stood there frozen, unable to believe what I was seeing. Then Tom said something that made Linda giggle, and something in me snapped. I burst into the room, roaring like a wounded animal. What the heck is going on here? They scrambled apart, Linda clutching the sheet to her chest, while Tom fell off the bed in shock. Sam, Linda gasped. Oh God, Sam, I can explain. But I wasn't listening. All I could see was red. I lunged for Tom, grabbing him by the throat and slamming him against the wall. You son of a bitch, I snarled. I trusted you, let you into my home. Tom was sputtering, trying to pry my hands off his neck. Linda was screaming at me to stop, but her voice sounded far away. All I wanted was to hurt this man who had betrayed me, who had taken advantage of my grieving wife. 
I don't know how long I stood there, choking the life out of Tom. It was Linda who finally broke through my rage, throwing herself between us and pushing me back with surprising strength. Sam, stop it. You're going to kill him. Her words were like a bucket of cold water. I let go of Tom, who slid to the floor gasping for air. Linda knelt beside him, checking to make sure he was okay. The tenderness in her touch made me want to start choking him all over again. Instead, I turned and walked out of the room, out of the house. I got in my truck and just drove. No destination in mind, just putting miles between me and the wreckage of my life. I don't remember much of that night, just driving aimlessly, alternating between rage and despair. By the time the sun came up, I found myself parked at the cemetery where Michael was buried. I sat there for hours, staring at my son's headstone and wondering how the hell we'd ended up here. How had we gone from that happy young couple at the county fair to this? Two broken people destroying each other and everyone around them. I'm sorry, Mikey, I whispered, touching the cold stone. I'm so sorry. We promised to take care of each other, your mom and me, but we've made such a mess of things. Tears streamed down my face as I poured out my heart to my dead son. All the pain, the anger, the guilt I'd been carrying for years. It felt like I was being torn apart from the inside. I don't know what to do, son, I admitted. I love your mom. God help me, I still do. But I don't think I can forgive this. I don't know if there's anything left to save. As I sat there, lost in grief and confusion, an old memory surfaced. Michael was about 12, and he'd gotten into a fight at school defending a smaller kid from bullies. When the principal called us in, Michael was sporting a black eye and a split lip. Violence is never the answer, Michael. I'd lecture it on the drive home. You can't solve problems by hurting people. Michael had looked at me with those earnest blue eyes. But Dad, sometimes you have to stand up for what's right, even if it's hard. Isn't that what you always say? I'd been so proud of him in that moment. My boy, already showing more character than most grown men I knew. Now, sitting by his grave, I wondered what he'd say about all this. Would he tell me to fight for my marriage? To forgive Linda? Or would he understand if I walked away? I didn't know how long I sat there, lost in memories and what-ifs. But as the sun began to set, I knew I had to go home and face the music. When I finally went home, Linda was waiting for me. She'd been crying. Her eyes were red and puffy, her hair a mess. For a moment, I saw a flash of the woman I'd fallen in love with all those years ago. But then I remembered her in bed with Tom, and my heart hardened. Sam, please, she began. We need to talk about this. I held up a hand to stop her. There's nothing to talk about. I want a divorce. Linda flinched like I'd slapped her. Sam, no, it was a mistake. I was drunk and lonely and... And what? You just fell into bed with our neighbor. Christ, Linda. In our bed. Our family bed. She started crying again, begging me to reconsider. Swearing it would never happen again, that she'd get help for her drinking. But it was too late. Whatever love had been left between us died the moment I saw her with Tom. I'm sorry, she sobbed. I'm so sorry, Sammy. Please, we can fix this. We've been through so much together. Don't throw it all away because of one stupid mistake. Her words hit me like a punch to the gut. We had been through so much. The good times, our wedding, the birth of our children, all those little moments of joy and love. And the bad, losing Michael, struggling with Linda's drinking, my own absence. For a moment, I wavered. Maybe we could fix this. Maybe. But then I remembered the sound of her laughter with Tom. How carefree she'd seemed, how alive. When was the last time she'd laughed like that with me? It's not just this, Linda, I said, my voice rough with emotion. It's everything. We've been broken for a long time. Maybe, since we lost Michael, we just didn't want to admit it. Linda's face crumpled. So that's it. 25 years of marriage, and you're just going to walk away? I took a deep breath, fighting back my own tears. I think we both walked away a long time ago. 
We just didn't have the courage to admit it until now. I called a lawyer that afternoon and started the divorce proceedings. Linda fought it at first, but eventually realized it was pointless. We were both too far gone, too damaged to salvage anything. The divorce was ugly. Years of resentment and pain came pouring out in the courtroom. Linda's drinking was brought up, as was my extended absences. We fought over the house, over money, over every little thing we could think of. One particularly brutal day in court, Linda's lawyer brought up my absence after Michael's death. Johanna, he said, Mr. Townsend abandoned his family in their time of need. While my client was struggling to cope with the loss of her son, her husband was off gallivanting across the country. I saw red, gallivanting. You son of a bitch, I was working. Someone had to pay the bills while your client was drowning herself in booze. The judge had to call a recess to let tempers cool. As we filed out of the courtroom, I caught sight of Emily sitting in the back, her face pale and drawn. The guilt hit me like a tidal wave. In our anger and pain, we'd forgotten the one person who needed us most. That night, I went to Emily's apartment. She'd moved out as soon as the divorce proceedings started, saying she couldn't stand to be in the middle anymore. When she opened the door, the look on her face broke my heart. She looked so tired, so much older than her 18 years. Hey, sweetie, I said softly. Can we talk? Emily stepped aside to let me in, her movements wary. We sat on her small couch, an uncomfortable silence stretching between us. I'm sorry, I finally said. Your mom and I, we've been so caught up in our own pain, we forgot about yours. That's unforgivable. Emily's lower lip trembled. I miss him too, you know. Michael, every day. But it's like, it's like I lost all three of you that night. Her words hit me like a physical blow. She was right. In our grief over Michael, we'd abandoned our daughter just when she needed us most. Oh, Emmy, I breathed, pulling her into my arms. She stiffened at first, then melted into the embrace, sobbing against my chest like she hadn't done since she was a little girl. I'm so sorry, baby, I murmured, stroking her hair. I've been a terrible father, but I promise you the ends now. Whatever happens with this divorce, you're not going to lose me. Okay. She nodded against my chest, her tears soaking my shirt. We sat like that for a long time, crying together for all we'd lost and all we put each other through. After that night, things changed. I asked my lawyer to tone down the aggressive tactics. Linda must have done the same, because the proceedings became less contentious. We started focusing on what was truly important, making sure Emily was okay. To everyone's shock, including my own, Emily chose to live with me after the divorce. Mom, I love you, she said, tears in her eyes as she broke the news to Linda. But I can't watch you destroy yourself anymore. I need stability right now. Those words seemed to finally wake Linda up. She checked herself into rehab the next day. Too little, too late as far as our marriage was concerned. But I was glad she was finally getting help. For Emily's sake, if nothing else. The divorce was finalized six months later. I got the house, primary custody of Emily. Linda got a hefty alimony payment and visitation rights. It was over. Twenty-five years of marriage reduced to a stack of legal documents and a broken family. As we left the courthouse for the last time, Linda caught my arm. Sam, she said, her voice small. I really am sorry. For everything. I looked at her, really looked at her, for the first time in months, she seemed smaller somehow, fragile. The anger I'd been carrying for so long softened, just a bit. I know Lindy, I said softly, using her old nickname without thinking. I'm sorry too, we both screwed up. She nodded, tears spilling down her cheeks. Do you think, do you think we could ever be friends again? Sunday. I sighed, running a hand through my hair. I don't know Linda. Maybe, someday, but not now. It's too raw, too painful. She nodded again, understanding in her eyes. Take care of our girl, okay? Always, I promised. We parted ways there on the courthouse steps. As I watched her walk away, I felt a chapter of my life closing. 
It hurt like hell, but there was also a sense of relief. The fighting was over. Now we could start to heal. In the aftermath, I threw myself into being there for Emily. We talked more in those first few months than we had in years. Slowly, painfully, we started to heal. Not just from the divorce, but from losing Michael. We shared memories of him, cried together, laughed together. It wasn't easy, but it felt like we were finally moving forward. One night, as we were looking through old photo albums, Emily came across a picture from her fifth birthday. It showed the four of us at the beach, building a sandcastle. We all looked so happy, so carefree. I miss this, Emily said softly, tracing the image with her finger. I miss us being a family. I put my arm around her, pulling her clothes. We're still a family, Emmy. It just looks a little different now. But your mom and I, we both love you more than anything in this world. That hasn't changed. She leaned her head on my shoulder. I know, it's just hard sometimes. I know, sweetheart, I said, kissing the top of her head. But we'll get through this, together. And we did. Day by day, we rebuilt our lives. Emily threw herself into her studies, determined to make Michael proud. I cut back on my long hauls, taking a job managing the local depot so I could be home more. Linda, well, she struggled. She'd stay sober for a while, then fall off the wagon. She lost her job at the hospital after showing up drunk on too many times. There were some scary nights when Emily and I would get calls from bars or the police station having to go pick her up. But she kept trying. Rehab, AA meetings therapy. Slowly, she started to put her life back together. Last I heard, she was working as a home health aide and still fighting her demons. As for me, I kept driving trucks for a while. But being on the road so much had cost me my family once. I wasn't about to let it happen again. So I took that job managing the local depot. Less money, but I was home every night with Emily. That was worth more than any paycheck. It's been five years since the divorce. Emily's in college now, studying to be a counsellor. She wants to help other families dealing with grief and addiction. I couldn't be prouder of her. You know, she told me recently, I used to be so angry at you and mom for falling apart, for not being there for me. But now, now I think I understand a little better. Grief does strange things to people. I held her tight, marveling at the wise, compassionate woman she'd become. You're a better person than I ever was, Emmy. Your brother would be so proud of you. She smiled, a hint of suddenness in her eyes. I like to think he's watching over us, you know, keeping us safe. I'm sure he is, sweetheart, I said, itemized and sing over. I'm sure he is. I see Linda sometimes around town. She looks older now, worn down by life and her choices. There's no anger left between us, just a dull ache for what might have been. We're not friends, not really, but we're civil. We can sit together at Emily's college events without it being awkward. It's progress. Last week, I ran into her at the grocery store. She was in the produce section, examining a tomato with more concentration than it probably deserved. I almost turned around and went down another aisle, but something made me stop. Hey, Linda, I said, approaching cautiously. She looked up, startled. Oh, Sam, hi. We stood there awkwardly for a moment, neither sure what to say. Then Linda blurted out, I'm six months sober. I blinked, surprised. That's, that's great, Linda, really. I'm happy for you. She gave me a small, tentative smile. Thanks. It's not easy, but I'm trying. For Emily, and for myself. I nodded, feeling a complicated mix of emotions. Pride in her progress, regret for what we'd lost, a lingering anger I couldn't quite shake. But mostly, I felt hope. Hope that maybe, just maybe, we could all find some peace. You know, I said slowly, Emily's having a little celebration next week. She made the Dean's List again. If you wanted to come, Linda's eyes widened. Really? You'd be okay with that? I shrugged. It's what Emily wants, and well, maybe it's time we all try to move forward. Together. Tears welled up in Linda's eyes. I'd like that, Sam. I'd like that a lot. 
As I watched her walk away, I felt something shift inside me. The anger, the bitterness I'd been carrying for so long. It didn't disappear, but it softened. Maybe this was what healing looked like, not forgetting the past, but learning to live with it. Finding a way forward, even when the path seems impossible. As for me, well, I'm still figuring things out. Dating at 52 isn't easy, especially with all my baggage, but I'm not giving up. Michael's death taught me how precious life is. Linda's betrayal showed me that even the strongest bonds can break. But Emily, my brave, beautiful girl, she reminds me every day that there's still love in this world, still hope. So I keep going, one day at a time. It's not the life I imagined all those years ago when Linda and I said I do, but it's my life. And for the first time in a long time, I'm actually living it instead of just surviving. Maybe that's the real lesson in all of this. Life doesn't always go according to plan. It can be messy and painful and unfair. But as long as you're breathing, there's a chance to start over, to heal, to find happiness again.